miss a reference, don't worry. Uh, I'll post a link to it most likely, or you can ask me to. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging, as we always do, that we're meeting here in Australia on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land. Sovereignty of this land was never ceded. This land was taken without consent, without treaty and without compensation. I pay my respects to elders and leaders, past, present and emerging of Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, traditional owners and First Nations all across the continent. I'm on Gundungurra and Darug land, where we say, Warami Gamarada, welcome comrades. We're very lucky to have Michelle O'Neill with us tonight, but before we get to that, first I'll tell everyone about the event and then give a 30 second intro to search and then a one minute intro to Michelle O'Neill and a, a very short intro to the National Economic Reconstruction Plan. Michelle will then speak for around 25 minutes and after that we will have questions which I invite you to submit in writing in the chat section to me directly. Uh, we'll wrap up on the hour uh, when you can either hang up or stay on the line for a few minutes to listen to a song during which time you can post messages to everyone including Michelle in the chat section. To enable us to run this efficiently uh, all participants will be muted unless called upon to ask a question. After you've asked your question please mute yourself again. Uh, when you submit your question, please let me know if you are happy to ask the question yourself or if you would like me to ask it and read it out on your behalf. The chat section is limited to messages to me as the host, um, but at the end of the meeting, you'll be able to message everyone, post links, including Michelle. Uh, you can also discuss what is being said during the event in our uh, Facebook event page. So I'll post the link to that and you probably would come through that to find out about the event in the first place. Uh, but if you'd like to discuss things live, you can, you can do so there. So a quick intro to SEARCH. SEARCH is a membership-based democratic socialist organisation that links and enables socialist activists across political parties, generations and movements all around Australia. We have members from diverse backgrounds and interests, but we have common aims and values, summarised in our goal of democratic ecological socialism. We run socialist education programs, publish news and views on Facebook and at search.org.au, and we put on events like this one. I encourage you to like the Search Facebook page and keep up with our events and go to search.org.au if you're interested in applying for membership or simply to get in touch with me to talk about what Search does. Our contact details are on the website and our Facebook page. Now to introduce Michelle O'Neill and the National Economic Reconstruction Plan. Michelle O'Neill is the president of the ACTU. She began her working life as a waitress, in fact so did I, uh, went on to work in the community sector with homeless young people and then, uh, then to work in the clothing industry. Before being elected as ACTU president in 2018, Michelle represented workers in the textile, clothing and footwear industry as an organiser and then branch and national secretary of the Textile, Clothing and Footwear Union of Australia. She represented her union nationally and internationally and led campaigns to win world leading rights for workers throughout clothing supply chains. A model of supply chain accountability for workers which increased pay and conditions for some of Australia's most exploited workers. Following the amalgamation of the TCFUA and the CFMU, Michelle was also the CFMU Vice President before becoming the President of the ACTU. Now, a quick, very quick introduction to the uh, National Economic Reconstruction Plan. I won't go into too much detail because Michelle's obviously here to talk about that. But just to give you a picture, and this is from the, the uh, plan itself. Australian unions have developed a national economic reconstruction plan with five concrete ideas to tackle the issues of jobs insecurity, inequality, and record low wage growth. The five specific proposals described in the NERP represent an initial agenda of immediate pragmatic actions that the Commonwealth government can, could take to get the ball rolling. On their own, they do not constitute the national jobs and reconstruction plan that Australia needs, but they are a big step in the right direction. I'll let Michelle talk more about that. Um, and go into that. So, Michelle, thank you for being with us tonight. And uh, over to you to talk, tell us more about the ACTU's National Economic Reconstruction Plan. Thanks very much, Luke. And thanks to the Search Foundation for inviting me to speak to you all tonight. And it's great to see some friends and comrades um, on the screen. And I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm speaking to you from tonight, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I want to pay all my respects to the elders past and present and always has been and always will be Aboriginal land. So yes, that means I'm here in Melbourne in the midst of a hard lockdown. Uh, but uh, in these strange times, it uh, is, of course, great to be able to join with you, if not in person, but um, 
in Zoom and across the kilometres. So, as I said, great to see you all. The, uh, I'm going to talk to you tonight about the ACTU's plan for national economic reconstruction, but I wanted to start by, I suppose, painting a picture about why we think this is so critically important. Uh, the world we took for granted just a year ago is almost unrecognisable to the one that we inhabit today. And for the millions of Australians who are already on the margins prior to the pandemic, the disadvantage they endured has been exacerbated in some of the cruelest ways, with a threat of being exposed to a deadly virus compounded with an economic hammer blow uh, of exploding unemployment and underemployment. As the implications of the pandemic continue to reveal themselves, it forces us to ask some pretty big questions. What kind of Australia do we actually want to emerge on this other side of the pandemic? What's the crisis taught us about the breadth of inequality and lack of fairness in our economy that delivers for some but leaves too many people struggling to actually make ends meet on a daily basis? And are we prepared to deal with the structural discrimination in our economy that's prioritised profits and share dividends over secure, good jobs and building real capacity in Australia's greatest asset, its working people? As we prepare to deal with the structural discrimination in our, sorry, are we going to be brave enough to finally address the mess that is Australia's lack of an energy policy and ensure that our energy needs are met in a sustainable way for the environment and in a manner that provides job security and opportunity for those Australian communities that currently rely on our carbon-based economy? Are we prepared to really face up to what's needed in terms of dealing with the challenges of climate change? We'll have a vision to commit to it. We will we have a vision to commit to a future that commits to a national and social infrastructure renaissance, investing in building the architecture for a vibrant, successful Australia for future generations while creating good jobs for today's workers. Unions know that it's through our collective effort that a crisis such as this pandemic is navigated. That sense of community and solidarity is in our DNA. It's why we've put forward a plan for national reconstruction. We need to understand that the nature of the economic crisis that we're in has hit us so hard and why. Our economy shuddered to a halt because it had to. The deliberate shutdown of large sections of the economy was vital to stop an explosion in, of infections that might have done in irretrievable damage to our society. It was sudden, shocking evaporation of economic activity the likes of which we haven't seen in nearly 90 years. Overnight, millions of Australians suddenly found their jobs disappear. And those sites of huge job queues spilling out across Australian, Australian streets shocked the nation. The truth is that the ill wind of the pandemic blew apart the house of straw that is our dependence on a huge insecure workforce. With over 32% of the workforce in insecure work, casuals, contract, gig economy and labour hire workers. Those hardworking Australians were exposed to the trapdoor economics we've embraced that leaves workers just one economic rough bump away from falling through the trapdoor into economic distress. With no sick pay, holiday pay, superannuation or other entitlements. We've created the paycheck to paycheck generation. Millions of ordinary Australians who don't know if they'll be able to pay their bills next week and worry if this is all the future has for them. The pandemic has made it crystal clear that we cannot go back to subjecting working Australians to this idea of trapdoor economics that delivers profits for business but treats workers as disposable. The type of insecurity that underpins the life of these workers is corrosive and unhealthy. It's unhealthy for them, for their families, for their communities and for our whole society. A fair society and economy is one where people have secure, well-paid jobs that build stronger, vibrant, confident communities. When the uh, economy stalled as the pandemic struck, it wasn't bankers, traders, hedge fund managers or overpaid executives who kept Australia functioning. It was cleaners, healthcare workers, teachers, early childhood educators, shop assistants, truckies, and other vital workers who did the heavy lifting. And this is why it's so important that, we, that this actually prompts us to reassess what it is we value in work, 
to reevaluate just how vital the ordinary workers of Australia are to the health and vitality of our wider community. It's actually an affront that the vast majority of these workers make up the workforce in that trapdoor economy, insecure workers, poorly paid and without entitlements and access to things like paid leave. It's a bit rich for companies to produce glossy ads proclaiming these workers as heroes, yet treat them as expendable. It's time the value of their work is reflected in their paying conditions. Similarly, the faith that so many coalition MPs have that the market as a cure-all for our economic woes has again been exposed as the furphy that it is. For decades, the neoliberal zealots would have us believe that as sure as the sun rose in the morning and set in the evening, the market was a staple of nature, pure in its construction and designed to adapt to any environmental conditions. We know that's never been true. We know from experience that too often the free market, untethered from regulation and oversight, is constructed to privatise profits in the good times and socialise losses in the tough ones. And so it was again. When this crisis hit, it was the unions who understood that the only way to keep Australian workers from sinking under the waves was with a government wage subsidy. That campaign and fight that many of you were part of to quickly demand that what we needed was to try and find a way of keeping workers in work was critical in the early days of the fight in terms of what was needed for a fair and just response to this pandemic. And of course, we did win a wage subsidy in the form of JobKeeper, but I don't want to suggest to you that in any way that is a perfect scheme, because we all know it has fundamental flaws that leave people out of what's been put in place. But it has succeeded in keeping three and a half million people connected to jobs over this period of time uh, that we've been going through the crisis. We can't talk about it without recognising who was left out. The notion that visa workers, that casual workers that hadn't been employed for more than 12 months in the one job, workers who happened by fate to work for a company that was owned by a foreign owned government, workers in higher education, um, to just name some, were all left excluded from this subsidy program. And in many cases also excluded particularly for migrant workers on short-term visas from access to any sort of income support or assistance in the, in the midst of the pandemic. We also joined with many others to fight for an increase, a fast increase in what was the dismal uh, rate, the distressful poverty rate of New Start, and along with those of others saw that doubling of the amount that was available under what's now called um, Looks like we've just had a bit of a freeze uh, with Michelle's feed. Malcolm Turnbull's NBN might be... Uh... Before, in 1942, as Australia was still fighting the Second World War, we saw the Curtin Labor government um, put in place a national reconstruction program. And in fact, they created a national reconstruction department led by the late Nugget Coombs and understood that to secure a peace dividend that was worthy of some of the sacrifices, it needed a comprehensive plan that committed a post-war government to creating society that offered productive work for everyone. Working Australians are crying out for a plan. And of course, we know that the society and the economy and the labour market are nothing like they were in 1942 we've seen a, a dramatic change in the participation of women in work. We've seen a shift in terms of the creation and expansion of the service sector and service industries. We've seen decline in manufacturing. And of course, we've seen this huge growth in insecure work. So when we build a plan, we need to be honest about where we're starting from. We need to make honest assessments of some of the problems we already had that we already knew that but prior to the pandemic, the economy was limping to a standstill. Growth was negligible with 14% of all workers um, being underutilised, either unemployed or underemployed. Australia had the, has the third highest rate of insecure work in the OECD. 
33% of workers with no access to paid leave. And wage growth has been pretty much non-existent for over seven years. And of course, we continue to have an obscene gender pay gap with women earning 14% less than men. Inequality of wealth and opportunity has become standardised in Australia. So any idea that return to business as usual is what Australia needs is plainly wrong because business as usual was a poverty trap for far too many Australians. So the ACTU sees this moment as an opportunity to address these inequalities and improve the sort of economy and society that we re rebuild. We wanna make sure that we improve public capacity to address community demand for health services that strengthen our national social and economic resilience. We wanna commit public money to invest in aged care, early childhood education, disability services and other programs. We wanna invest in the social capital that's the bedrock of strong communities and is the best investment any government can make. We need to make sure that we make stuff again. The pandemic has shown that Australia has grown um, lazy as a primary resources provider stuck at the end of the supply chain. Australia needs a sector development strategy to nurture the high quality industries of the future. And we need to do all of these things within the framework of meeting our commitments internationally to address climate change with a comprehensive policy that drives Australia toward the, towards a net zero emissions future. So the ideas that we've got. So we believe that we need to have a national economic reconstruction plan. And that plan needs to be ambitious and comprehensive. We think the government needs to act fast to get the country back to work. And that plan that will support, it needs to be a plan that will support jobs for women as well as men, for people in the public sector as well as in the private sector, for those in cities as well as those in country towns, and for young people as well as older workers. So we're putting forward five concrete ideas that are, are a step towards this plan. They don't in themselves make up the plan. The first of which is the early childhood education and care strategy. So this strategy has a few components within it. It includes the provision of permanently free childcare, capital investment to construct new high quality, publicly funded not-for-profit facilities, the funding of universal access to 15 hours of preschool for three and four year olds, and an extension and improvement of wage subsidies and support for the sector and ongoing net, uh, plans to address the terrible undervaluation of women's work in that sector and their rates of pay. Secondly, training for reconstruction. A new nationwide free TAFE program that would support 150,000 free TAFE places as, um, and also support 10,000 jobs in the TAFE sector. We want to put TAFE back at the centre of Commonwealth and State government training funding with committing 70% of all government vocational education and training towards public TAFE. The creation of a rebuilding TAFE fund that would allow for the updating and modernising of facilities with a particular focus in regional areas. We also want to see as part of this training and education wage subsidies of 50% for up to 100,000 apprenticeships and trainees for the life of their apprenticeship and traineeship with a guaranteed job at the end of the training. And to assist the higher education sector, we want the Commonwealth Government to extend JobKeeper wage subsidies to universities and uh, to make sure that we deal with the likely ongoing crisis of 20,000 higher education jobs being at risk in that sector. Thirdly, we want to uh, deal with a program, create a program called Rediscover Australia. And this plan is going to support 350,000 jobs in tourism, the arts, accommodation, travel and regional services over the next 12 months. The key elements of it are Commonwealth sponsorship of artistic community, agricultural and entertainment events, productions and exhibitions in all states. Additional grant support for the Australia Council to support grants recipients for emergency financial requirements that came through the shutdowns. Expansion again of JobKeeper subsidies to include arts and entertainment workers. And for the Commonwealth for a 12 month period to take over payment of regular state payroll taxes 
for paid employees in two industries that are critical to domestic travel and tourism, passenger transportation and overnight accommodation. Fourthly, a national reconstruction investment plan. Overseen by Infrastructure Australia, this is a $30 billion per year um, injection of funds to significantly boost investment in public capital projects, including funding for transportation, community and public tra housing, cultural and public service facilities, forest and fire management investment, and renewable energy assets and efficiency upgrades. The National Reconstruction Investment Plan would support the creation of 75,000 direct jobs in construction and over 100,000 additional indirect jobs in supply and consumer industries. And lastly, the fifth is the Sustainable Manufacturing Strategy. So we want to see within this strategy, government rules to ensure Australian made products in all new infrastructure and public service procurement. Zero interest loans to new renewable energy developments with a direct link to manufacturing. Support for large gas and electricity users to upgrade equipment as part of energy conservation plans. Expanded Commonwealth investments in rapid decarbonisation of the energy sector. Technology grants to support commercialised research and development in this sector and five new sustainable manufacturing clusters in some key areas, lithium battery and value-added manufacturing, renewable hydrogen production, green primary metal manufacturing, electric vehicle manufacturing and servicing, and renewable energy machinery. And as well as superpower investment fund to undertake co-investments, including public equity shares in new sustainable manufacturing activities. So as you can see, um, we have a view about what is needed is that is ambitious, it's broad and comprehensive. Every one of us has got our own vivid and personal memories of what's been happening during the pandemic. And we've been very conscious that uh, so many working people have stepped up in ways that would, they would never have expected to do throughout this crisis, not just in the jobs they've been paid to do, and the amazing flexibility uh, and capacity they have to change, whether that's change from working at, in a workplace to working at home or change how they work to be able to serve us in a way that's safe both for workers and for consumers. But that what we do know is that working people have a, a great fear of what's to come. People have a innate belief in the importance of sticking together coming through that. This has come out in throughout the crisis that we've seen the, the, an extraordinary example of people's belief in solidarity and looking out for each other and actually sticking together, which of course is at the heart, the fundamental heart of unionism. But we know that now to win bigger change, to not just have those who have interest of profit only at, at heart, win the day in terms of the type of reconstruction we have. We need to organise and organise collectively across our movement and with many allies to bring about the sort of changes and the sort of plan that I've just outlined to you. I, I want to acknowledge that in putting together these ideas and this plan, we, uh, we were greatly assisted by Dr Jim Stanford from the Centre for Future Work that I'm sure is known to some of you. And in all, the plan that I've outlined is, would support 1.1 million jobs across key industries. But it would also lay the groundwork for the health and prosperity of the next generation through investments in education, early learning, women's participation in the labour force, Australian manufacturing, and boosts to the renewable economy. This type of investment provides a lasting legacy for future generations that will help build their future prosperity. So as we continue in the lockdown here in Victoria, we're reminded that fighting this virus is a collective effort. Unions at our heart understand collectivism. That's who we are. And the road back to Australia, we believe, is also going to be a collective effort. An Australia that believes in full employment. Australia that doesn't leave people behind. An Australia where working women have the same access and opportunities as men. An Australia that invests in young people through education and training and jobs. An Australia where the colour of your skin or the language you speak doesn't determine your rights and opportunities. And we know that we're asking a lot of government and that these plans come at a cost to the government. 
but we also know the cost of not acting. We believe in spending public money for the public good. Unemployment, poverty and inequality have generational impacts that cost us all as a society and leaving our fellow Australians behind has a cost. And we know that this social deficit is much harder to pay off in the long run. So Australia needs a government-led national economic reconstruction plan, one that's ambitious, comprehensive and fast. And we've put together a plan that will support and create jobs, as I said, for women and men, for people in the public and private sector, for those in the cities as well as the towns, and for young people and older workers. Because we know if you don't look after people, people can't look after the economy. Thanks, Lou. I think everyone on this call will be in furious agreement on that one. Thank you so much for that. It's a shame we can't um, all applaud like you would in a, a normal union meeting, but I'm sure everyone is uh, applauding, uh, hopefully from the comfort of their own home or wherever they are. I know my partner, Victoria, is sitting at um, uh, footy training for my, my six-year-old on the phone in the car, uh, watching her on the field. So she's, not everyone's at home. Uh, we're getting lots and lots of questions coming through. I want to start with the first one is from 14-year-old uh, Ivy. I think that's Melinda McMillan's uh, uh, child, Ivy, so I'm assuming it may be Ivy McMillan. I can see Ivy there. Oh, very good. <laughs> um, how do we get the government to change their minds? The problem seems to be more about a set of beliefs held by the government than the reality. So, you know, it's a, a big question. We've been discussing this in a lot of our um, of these uh, uh, meetings and, and forums about what's the strategy. So. You know, how do we get the government to change their minds um, and how's the reception been to this plan? I think it's a couple of weeks old now or uh, 10 days or so. Uh, so, you know, how, how, what's the strategy for getting this adopted, I suppose, is the question then. Yeah, look, um, thanks, Emily. The, for us, of course, like any big plan for change, the strategy has to be about organising and mobilising your base and about um, engaging people in a way where people understand the issues and are part of fighting for the change. So, and, and as well as this work that we're doing on jobs and the economy, we, of course, are also dealing with... Um, many who are many in the business community who are arguing that the answer to the future of saving and creating jobs in Australia is in fact driving down paying conditions and so-called flexibilities in the um, industrial relations system that would actually leave workers more vulnerable. So we've also got a defensive campaign um, that's important, which is about dealing with those that are trying to use the pandemic as an excuse to actually worsen the rights of working people. So it's a really good point, Emily. I, I, what I know about change is that it, you have to build broad support. You've got to make, and, and partly this is, and, and part of the problem we're fighting for change about when you start to talk about the economy is that, um, you know, it, it, many of those people and conservatives who whose concern is about profit rather than people try and own the conversations about the economy um, and and try and talk about it in a way that it, that they mystify it um, and make it as if it's something that's not about the ordinary lives of ordinary people. So what we're trying to do at the ACTU and throughout the union movement is take these ideas and take them out to workplaces and. I'm using old fashioned terminology there really when I say out to workplaces. It's the case in some um, parts of Australia that we can physically get into workplaces and workers are in them. But of course, there's many workers in many workplaces where that's not the case at the moment. So find ways both in person, but also importantly, uh, through forums like this ones um, and through mass meetings that now don't just happen in workplaces or on the streets, but also happen online and virtually. Um, try and ways of getting these messages out in ways that are accessible, strong and, and understandable, um, and, and then building the campaign, the fight for this change at that level. So at this point, that's, that's a big part of what we're doing, getting this message out there, talking to people about don't be afraid of debt, don't fall for this idea that, you know, it's a bad thing that government's spending money. We actually have to build public understanding about why now is the time to spend. And in fact, if the government goes for an austerity approach rather than a spending and 
uh, and stimulus approach, we will have a longer depression, more people will be unemployed, the economy and the society will be much worse off. So we're, we're trying to unpack it, if you like, into those type of concepts and building the support about why government needs to act, why government needs to spend, and that we can't rely on private enterprise or the sort of idea that it'll all be right um, as the answer. Part of that is dealing with um, uh, uh, getting people active in talking publicly um, and making those demands to government um, in all of the different ways that we now have available to us. Um, and some of those are more limited than we are in the past, but we've become pretty creative about campaigning in, in ways online as well as in person, in workplaces and the streets and also virtually. Thank you for that. I've got a question now from, from Jane Jury. Um, I think Jane's not on video, but I'll unmute her and she can ask her a question. Can you hear me? Yep. Thanks, Luke. And thank you, Michelle. I really appreciate you being online. I can see that you are beyond exhaustion. <laughs> but, um, and I wanted to say, firstly, just how comprehensive Clearly have been, you and Sally and others have been doing a lot of hard work to develop such a comprehensive plan, covering those really important issues around arts, tourism, public housing, forests, fires, etc., which, um, and apprenticeships, and I guess TAFE, because I mean, having found myself now doing some casual work in TAFE and seeing how it has been gutted by the lack of funding over the last two decades, it really, it's, it's fantastic to see that up there as a top priority in your plan. What I, what I wanted to ask you really is to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more about how you see these five steps as uh, more directly, if you could talk more directly to how you see them dealing with, firstly, with climate change. And, and I know you outlined some of that in the steps, but, and also, but secondly, but certainly not last, um, least, the dealing with inequality for women and for marginalised groups, both in terms of work, but also in quality of life. Thanks, Jane. Lovely to hear your voice. Um, and, and yeah, two very easy questions there. Um, <laughs> the, uh, look, I, I, I want to, um, uh, we have tried, we, in fact, with both your questions, Jane, we've tried to develop the plan in a way that doesn't take um, either of those issues and make them an add-on or a sort of section alone. So beginning first, with, of course, with climate change, uh, we don't think that coming through this crisis and looking what is needed for jobs and the economy in the future, that the answer to that is to say, well, we do all of this and, oh, by the way, we better remember that we've got to do something to reduce emissions and deal with climate change. So we, we've said we needed to bring to central to the plans and the work we were doing, um, how we take into account the failure of Australia um, to really ensure that we have a plan to address climate change and particularly also a plan that addresses um, our energy needs into the future. So it, I suppose what, the first thing I'd say is that we've tried to weave it all the way through rather than just say, here's the section about climate. Um, secondly, I, I'd say we've, we've put a particular focus on energy um, and on the need to reduce um, uh, our reliance on fossil relate, fuel related energy. So basically, how do we move to more renewable energy sources and what are the ways, particularly with big energy users um, in the manufacturing sector that the government can really turbocharge that change so that you practically put in place programs that will actually drive reduction in energy use and switch to renewables um, in that sector. And uh, that there's a very big focus on that. And I think I, I spoke about some of the elements of it um, when I went through it, but really trying to look at not just, uh, so look at existing manufacturing and how you drive change in 
the type of energy that they're using and what they need to change in terms of their products, but also their access to the grid and what needs to happen in terms of the grid, et cetera, to get them there. But also about, well, what type of products in the future would we be making that will actually harness um, the change in uh, renewable energy. And of course, we've, we've lent, went, lent a fair bit on some of the ideas that have come from Ross Garno around that sort of new energy future and what that might lead to in terms of regional jobs as well. So it, it is, um, I really urge you to have a look at, at some of those things, but that the energy and energy in relation to manufacturing is a key part of it. The other thing I'd say though is, and this is why it's we've we really wanted to make sure we were talking about public as well as private sector and also about the type of jobs and about regional jobs is that we know that when you talk about change and you talk about change to communities that have been um, reliant on the resource industry for many years um, you can't just talk about theory you can't just say oh you know don't worry about this impact about you know your job and your industry disappearing um, it'll all be all right you know nobody's going to swallow that and people don't swallow that workers don't so having a um, plan for jobs and recovery that is driven at a local level about creating good quality sustainable jobs um, is really critical to that because you can't you, you can't you've got to have a one step to an alternative um, for people rather than a wish and a prayer um, and people have got to believe that it's not just that they'll have a job, but that their kids and their grandkids will have a job in those communities as well. So that another part of the thinking is that's why you, you have a, a reconstruction plan that um, has secure jobs as, at, at its core, but also doesn't just think about big city employment, but thinks about what we need to do in terms of regional employment um, is another reason. And I think that's very linked to what we're thinking about the needs in terms of climate change as well. Um, and, and of course, things like the ones you mentioned, like dealing with the uh, what we need in our environment, the sort of jobs that can be created that are actually going to protect us and put us in a safer position and uh, deal with uh, what needs to be done in terms of caring for our environment. Um, our ideas are there too. In relation to women, um, again, we don't, we've been shocked, like many, about how one of the big differences with the recession that's come out of this crisis is that it has been so um, disproportionately affecting women. So not surprising, of course, where you look at where what's been happening with women's work. So if you look at who the majority of workers in insecure jobs are, um, in low paid jobs, in jobs in the sectors that have been most hard hit by the pandemic, they're uh, of course jobs, the majority of which are women workers. And so all those structural inequalities that were in existence before we were in the pandemic have just been exposed um, by where we've ended up now. So when we've thought about recovery, we've been very conscious that a lot of what many um, people talk about and go straight to is big infrastructure projects and of course big infrastructure projects are really important but if our only plan for jobs is about blue collar male jobs then we're going to you know create even worse inequality in the years to come and the recovery of course will only work for some not for all so again our emphasis on how do you build public and community service jobs sector jobs how do you ensure that we look at when you think of early childhood education and care not just um, what needs to happen in terms of public provision of good quality early childhood education and care but also about what needs to happen in terms of the wages and recognition of the skills of workers in that sector and then thirdly what you need to do to actually make childcare free and accessible for all. One of the big things we know about Australia's labour market is even though women participate at a much greater rate than we used to, it's still um, the participation rate of women in Australia compared to many other um, equivalent countries in the OECD is, is far lower 
And so a boost to the economy in itself um, of just having women participate at an equivalent rate to those countries would be massive. So free childcare, of course, is uh, about driving women um, women's participation, making it uh, accessible that women can genuinely participate. So all of those things uh, are in there, as well as, I think, um, an emphasis on industries and sectors like a lot of the plans around travel, hospitality, arts, etc., is about trying to look at jobs that women are in as well. And uh, on that, a quick shout out to our New South Wales Shadow Minister for Early Education, uh, Early Childhood Education, who's joined us tonight, uh, Jody Harrison MP. So good to see you on here as well. And also to my local federal MP, Susan Templeman. Thanks for joining us. Um, question: uh, I've got a question from Jody. It's just come through actually. Um, an ongoing fundamental problem in the early childhood education sector is staff shortages, predominantly caused by by low pay. Will this be exacerbated if there is greater workforce participation and universal access? There have been a number of attempts to rectify this. Is there a current planned mechanism to fix this from a union perspective? Well, um Really, it's a mess at the moment, isn't it? Um, and in fact, made worse by the announcements um, just in the last couple of days with, you know, we had that early removal of JobKeeper, premature removal of JobKeeper from workers in the early childhood education and care sector, which took place a couple of weeks ago. And then, of course, we see what's happened in Melbourne and Victoria. And um, as of today, uh, those workers, 97% of whom are women, are um, uh, left without any income support because they've not reinstated JobKeeper. They've put in place a subsidy and support um, mechanism that basically goes to the employers. It does leave um, positions, childcare places open to parents, but there's no link between that financial subsidy and money going to the workers so that you can actually get the amount of um, subsidy from the government and there is no minimum hours or minimum pay that has to then be passed on to the workers in those childcare, early childhood education and care sectors. So an outrageous sort of gap hole in that response. They just didn't want to admit they were wrong, I think, by taking JobKeeper away from that sector a few weeks ago. So instead of fixing it, they've just tried to do something that is um, you know, really going to exacerbate the problem for those workers. Jody, I, I think the, that um, there's been, you know, great campaign work done. The two key unions in the sector, as you know, are the United Workers Union, the Australian Education Union, um, are, are around, you know, big steps, for example, in terms of UWU. And the, the, the view about how you uh, it's partly about how you value and how you fund. So my understanding is that it's about making sure that the funding that goes into the sector, you know, that there is a priority in terms of the funding of the public sector, um, uh, public provision of uh, childhood education and care, and that also um, it is linked to the increase in wages um, that workers receive in that sector. So instead of it being as if, you know, in disconnected, given the amount of government money that goes in, the conditionality on that, that you actually see a movement arise in the value of the um, those jobs and what people are paid for them. So you would, some of you would be remember the work that was done, the big win that the ASU had in terms of pay equity in the community sector about eight, nine years ago, in fact, and re resulted in eight years of gradual increases to address a, a very similar problem about undervaluing of women's work in the community sector. So uh, I don't, I'm not going to pretend to be a child um, care or early childhood education and care expert because I'm not, but my understanding is that a similar approach that's about building in steps to pay equity and, and higher that and not having, you know, one of the problems we've got in the Fair Work Act at the moment is that if you try and win a pay equity case, and this is where early childhood educators fell foul of this, um, there's still the notion of the male comparator. So you, we're, within our legislation, instead of just winning on the value of the work in itself, that you've got to run a case that compares it to an equivalent male, predominantly male job and skill set, which is 
ridiculous and flawed and of course has meant that it, that part of the act fails to address pay equity so longer term of course we also need to um, win a change in the fair work act that actually creates a proper set of pay equity principles in there and mechanisms that can deliver equal pay that is a yeah outdated anachronistic way of uh, valuing that work um, a question about coming back to the plan as a whole. It's a question, one from uh, Peter Murphy and one from Comrade John Sutherland. Um, similar questions. John's question is, what's the interaction between this alternative plan and the others that have uh, been put out by unions? We had Tim Kennedy on. Um, we had Adam Bant talking about their plan uh, and other social and political organisations that, that to some extent have crossover content. And a similar question from, from Peter Murphy. How has the, the Business Council of Australia, the government, Labor and the Greens responded to the ACTU plan so far? Um, hi, Don. Hi, Peter. Um, so, look, I think that, um, comrades, the, the first issue about other progressive forces um, there's a lot of commonality, um, you, you know, the work that has come out of the UWU recently, you, you would see there's sometimes a slight difference in, you know, terminology, but at its core, I think they're completely consistent. Um, and similarly, uh, the AMWU came out with a, a great plan last week around um, the manufacturing industry and what need what's needed in terms of jobs and recovery for manufacturing. So uh, this plan that I've taken you through tonight, all of the unions, including the United Workers Union, the AMW, and all of the private and public sector unions, it's been endorsed by the whole of the Australian union movement. We've got a great um, advantage in Australia that we have one national movement and one, uh, one body that unions affiliate to, unlike many other countries where there's multiple national centres. So the fact that we have a unity of view of um, what's needed uh, is, I think, does give us a, a much greater traction about these ideas and how we're going to win them. But having said that, I think having uh, affiliated unions take elements of it and develop it up in a way that's going to speak to their members and create other allies to back it in is powerful and, and it's actually consistent. So the more that we can both have a unity of purpose but also allow for that capacity for people to take elements that are going to be most powerful, the people that they're representing and build on those elements and win support for that, the stronger the whole thing's going to be. So I actually think there's my sense of it is that they're entirely consistent. Um, and uh, as far as the, um, the response from the government and the business council and others, look, the government think the government's response is, you know, they haven't formally responded despite our request for them to do so. Um, if you listen to them, I think what they're saying is, you know, we're all about jobs. Um, and so their narrative is that they've got a plan about jobs. But if you scratch the surface of that, as I think I've already said tonight, it, it is haphazard at best, um, doesn't have at its core the sort of things that we're talking about, about how you actually drive change rather than um, what really support select industries and sectors and, and in many cases the employers in those sectors without conditionality that drives um, good secure jobs. So uh, I will continue to talk to them about elements of it but part of winning change is that we are talking to employer groups as well because I think that some elements of the plan I've just taken you through uh, there is support amongst elements of the business community for. And the more that we can identify those elements and get them publicly supporting it on board, the better. Um, the more chance with this uh, type of government that we've got, uh, the more chance we're gonna get them to do it. So, um, you know, that, that was true in, in the fight around wage subsidy. You know, in, in early days, it was the union movement calling for it. One of the things in as that campaign built, 
and a lot more working people were talking about it and we were building momentum, one of the things that helped shift was in fact a number of business groups also coming on board and supporting it. So I'm not suggesting that that's the only way you win change, but I think in our current climate with the current government, um, if we can have some of those business groups of support elements, if not all of it, the better. And we're, do, we're working on that. So um, there's not a sort of short answer to it, Peter. Um, I, I don't think we've got any of those peak business groups saying, yes, tick, we agree with all of it. And I don't think we ever will, but I think parts of it, we definitely um, have support for. And some of that's happening um, uh, already. In, uh, you, hear, you might hear them speak about elements of it. Yeah, well, the wins that you've already had on um, income support and other things uh, certainly encourage the idea that there can be some uh, wins even with the hostile government. Um, a question from Janine Kitson about specifically <clears throat> around um, the, the uh, Rediscover Australia plan. Um, so with that plan, she's asking, will there be investment uh, in regional ecotourism that focuses on rehabilitation and restoration of degraded natural areas and biodiversity protection? Um, will there be investment in, uh, sorry, it says that there will be investment in ecotourism infrastructure projects that are compatible, compatible with the values of national parks and state conservation areas and world heritage areas. I'm not sure if that's the sort of detail that you might have at hand, but yeah. Look, Janine, it, it, they're great ideas. It's it's not specific within this report that we've gone there in that part of the plan. Um, it's not um, it's not that it couldn't part happen within it, but it's not something we explored in that section around the Rediscover Australia bid. The focus on that was very much about, as I said, about trying to get people local domestic tourism happening and happening in a way where um, uh, we had people travelling again and supporting those jobs. But of course, it, that that fundamental premise that if you can try and support the growth of those parts of the industry that are also dealing with the challenges of the environment and climate change is a good idea. It, but I, we don't go into that detail in the plan, but it's a great idea. And I'm sure um, any of these questions that we've got a lot of questions coming through, but we are getting pretty close to, to closing time. I know you've had a very busy day, so we'll probably um, wrap up there with five minutes to go uh, and let people um, have uh, go to their you know, respective dinners and let you get to um, finish for the day, hopefully. Um, perhaps with this one last question um, from uh, Liz Falcard, Union of Shoalhaven. Uh, they've got the highest youth unemployment in the country in the Shoalhaven. Uh, the TAFEs have been de decimated. Um, like this plan would see our youth in secure training and careers. Um, with federal Labor members covering huge areas, how best can we get support for the plan? Um, I think... Uh We've sent, well, so just on the detail, we've, we've sent the, this plan or are sending it to every member of parliament federally. Um, and of course, we've talked to the Labor Party um, in more detail about it. We've briefed them about it and have asked the, them to support the plan and elements of the plan. And similarly, we've, we've done that with the Greens. Um, I think that, there's a lot of detail in it. So um, there, there's elements of it that are already things that you would hear Labor talking about. Um, but we would hope that some of the more detailed things that they will support and will come back to us around. So there's, there's things that I understand from the Labor Party that they also might want to not be talking about now, but might want to be talking about closer to an election as well, given a whole lot of these things are things that they can't currently implement. Um, my view would be the more that they can be out there um, differentiating and talking about why this is good for working people and their families and communities. And I know the Shoalhaven, I know how shocking that youth unemployment figures are. Um, so I think having, you know, alternative voices that 
that basically don't accept that as inevitable, but do say that this is urgent, that we can't sort of just live on the idea that there'll be an election, you know, maybe next year, more likely, I reckon, next year than the year after. Like, this is this is change that we've got to campaign and drive now because literally young people are going to be left behind. And I, I'm sure some of you have seen some of the research that's come out already about how disproportionately it's affecting young people because, again, they were already in insecure work, they already had suffered greater in terms of low wage growth over the period of time, and you're going to see generational impacts on this, let alone, of course, what we haven't mentioned tonight, they're also the people that have raided the super. So, they're, you know, they're people who literally more than half a million people with zero now left in their super accounts think, and, and that's a shocking indictment of government policy, that that's been allowed to happen, like that we will be paying for this for generations, and it's young people and women that will really pay the price of that, of not having a dignified retirement, because the compounding effect of that super disappearing now will leave people in poverty when they are older. So uh, that I suppose I'm just agreeing that we've got to fight to win these changes now. We can't. It, it should, of course, be part of what a Labor Party and and Greens and others incorporate into their policies for the future. But we can't wait. Can't wait. We've got to, We've got to win answers to this now, and that's what we're focusing on. Trying to win this fight with as much of it as possible with this government, and we're not naive about that. Um, but it's strange times and it's strange times create strange opportunities to get governments that might not other, otherwise do things, do things. And we've already seen a bit of that. So I've got a bit of optimism about um, what we can do at the moment. Well, thank you very much. The last comment I'll, I'll leave to Brad Crofts. He says, congratulations, Michelle, the work that the government's COVID commission should have done. So uh, <laughs> I think that's, thank you very much for this. Um, before, uh, we go to a song, um, and it's a bit of a classic Solidarity Forever. I had to choose it for the president of the ACTU. Uh, we've had Can I just tell you, I don't have a voice like Bob Hawke, though, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, I <laughs> am. <laughs> but that's a great it's choice, on. Luke. It's okay. <laughs> and as I said at the beginning, we'll now allow everyone to um, exchange messages in the chat section. Um, to Michelle, to other people, you can talk to long lost comrades that you're seeing there in the uh, on the on the Zoom, um, and post any links that you like as well. Uh, while that you can do that while we're playing this song, uh, but I want to thank thank you so much, Michelle, for for being there and for giving us this. It's been fantastic. Uh, as I said, we'll post this on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Please, everybody who's been here, please share it. In, in my view, the more people who know about this plan, the more people will inspire. Uh, and we'll engage um, from you know all walks of life and all industries. It's a it's a really wonderful document. It's something I think that everyone can get behind. And I think the more people know about it um, and learn about it, and of course not everyone will read the entire plan, but a lot of people will probably uh, take the time to listen to a, a half hour talk on YouTube by Michelle. So please everyone share this when it goes up on the search uh, Facebook page uh, tomorrow and on the search YouTube channel. I'll give you the, the final word and then when you're finished, I'll, uh, I'll start playing Solidarity Forever. Thanks, Luke. Can, look, can I just say thank you to all the friends and comrades and people I haven't met on the line tonight. It's great to see this many of you who are actually wanting to hear about the plan of the Australian Union movement. Um, I know many of you are involved any, every day in fighting for justice and fairness and in all sorts of campaigns and ways to support people through the crisis and get us all to a better place in terms of the sort of society and economy we wanna have. So just wanna pay tribute to all the extraordinary hard work you all do. Um, and thank you for your solidarity and support. Thanks a lot, comrades. Cheers. As I said, you can stay on the line or you can uh, uh, ring off now, but um, now we will hear Solidarity Forever. <laughs> 